I'm the CEO of the San Francisco Foundation, and I'm one of uh, three co-chairs for this effort. Um, and what I want to do is I'm going to say a couple of things to kind of get us going, but before that, just kind of uh, walk people through the agenda. We're going to start with um, uh, a little bit of update uh, in terms of where we are and to try to give you all a sense of uh, not only where we are, but where we're headed. Um, we're going to go right from there into public comment. We wanted to make sure that we uh, had that at the top before we get into the discussion uh, about the compact that you have in front of you. Uh, and then we have really two big meaty items. We want to, uh, Steve is going to go over uh, the draft compact and give you an overview of it at a 30,000 foot level. We're not going to dive into each one of the uh, items again this time. And then, you know, for at least the last six to eight months, um, the staff at MTC, along with uh, GARE, has been working on a racial equity analysis to uh, look at kind of the, the equity impacts of the work that uh, is going on, and there'll be a, a presentation of that as well. Um, so that is, that is the day. Uh, and again, let me just say um, welcome, and also just uh, uh, for those who uh, celebrated, happy Hanukkah. Uh, we're right in the middle, uh, just starting that. Um, this is uh, the final meeting of the technical committee. Um, and, you know, I, don't, I know I can uh, speak for myself when I say that I knew this job was dangerous when I took it. Um, but it has been uh, both more time consuming and uh, more complicated than at least I anticipated. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think that there have been uh, some really uh, great conversations that have come out of this. I, for me, I've been working on uh, housing issues for a very long time, and this is one of the uh, first times that I have seen folks come together to talk about this issue at a regional level of scale. Uh, and it's the first time uh, that I have seen uh, the cast of characters that we have around this table uh, talking about this issue together uh, and really in earnest talking about uh, the things that concern them, the things that they want to see happen, all in the spirit of trying to reach a high common denominator uh, around solutions. Um, what it means for us uh, in terms of this being the last meeting of the technical committee is that we think that we, we asked you to do uh, has been done. Uh, when we put this together, uh, our, our idea and our hope was that the technical committee would be able to come together, uh, meet frequently. Uh, you've definitely done that. Um, but also uh, give your best thinking uh, to what some solutions might be. Uh, and to, in the context of that best thinking, try your best to kind of get out of your silo. Uh, and what we mean by that is uh, not just kind of take a hard position on stuff, but actually listen to the concerns that other uh, folks were expressing and try to figure out a way uh, to move us forward. And we think we've done that. What that means is that the, if you um, vote affirmatively today, and we're going to use the uh, gradients of agreement, what's going to happen is that the co-chairs uh, will uh, take what we hear from you today um, we don't plan to do a whole lot of uh, changes to what we have in front of us if we can uh, adhere to that, uh, and then pass it to the, the steering committee. Uh, the steering committee uh, will also take a vote on it. There will also be votes that uh, will be taken at MTC uh, and ABAG commission and board levels. Uh, and after running uh, that gauntlet, uh, many of these things, as you all know, uh, have legislative implications, so it will be turned over uh, to the legislature uh, and members there to uh, continue the, the conversation. Uh, that means that uh, basically you will be turning it over uh, to a variety of public processes, um, the ones that exist at ABAG and MTC, uh, and then the process in Sacramento uh, that will also be going there. Uh, which leads me to another point, which is what we've tried to do uh, with the compact is get to um, enough detail so that folks can really understand what's there and what, uh, what we're trying to accomplish um, without um, getting to such a level of detail that when it gets to uh, the other public bodies and particularly to uh, Sacramento that it just doesn't break under the amount of detail that's there. Uh, and so, you know, we will continue to have the conversation uh, with you um, around whether or not we've hit that mark. Um, the last thing that I would say is, um, you know, we are definitely looking uh, for the blessing to move this forward, and we're going to use uh, the gradients of agreement today. And what that means is that uh, you won't just have to vote 
uh, yes or no on this. Uh, we're giving you the opportunity uh, to, like we have done in past meetings, really weigh in around the, the nuances of how you feel about this so that we can have a, not only a sense of whether folks want to move forward or not, but also a sense of uh, kind of how strongly you want to move forward. And if you don't feel strongly, if there are things that could be uh, added that could kind of change the, your perspective on this stuff. Um, so I will stop there and uh, pass it to Leslie, and then we will, uh, as I said, go to public comment, and then we will return. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I really want to chime in and thank the technical committee as well for all of the hard work that you've done, as well as, as the moderators who have really stepped up, and I concur 100% with Fred that this has been a really heavy lift and uh, really excited about the incredible work that's been done and and what what we will be achieving in the next uh, year or so uh, through the legislative process. Uh, Fred recapped the roles of the technical committee and so I just want to reaffirm the roles of the steering committee and also the co-chairs. Uh, so the steering committee will will be meeting next week on the 12th and will be uh, receiving the recommendations of the technical committee uh, and also uh, their their role has been what has been to generate ideas on their own and to to provide input which it is done and then they will be casting the final vote to approve or disapprove the compact the co-chair's roles are to make final decision on what goes to the steering committee for consideration, and we make our decisions together uh, by consensus. So Mike, Fred, and I all need to agree in order for something to move forward. So Fred talked a little bit about this, so I, I will go quickly through it. Uh, but today is the first day that bills are being introduced in the legislature. So some housing bills are undoubtedly being uh, introduced today. Um, and some of them are similar ideas to those that we want to move forward. Uh, so we'll be working with those bills. I mentioned that the steering committee is meeting next week. And then uh, the MTC Commission and ABAG will be meeting later this month and in January. And uh, it's Im important to say that we are, we are hoping that they will endorse the package, uh, but the, this is not a package that is an ABAG or MTC package, so we're not asking specifically for their approval in order to move forward. Uh, we plan a celebration party, uh, which would be a joint steering committee and technical committee meeting in January to formally thank everyone, talk more about what's, what's ahead, and we might have a ceremonial signing at that time where we're talking about what that, uh, what that will look like. Um, and lastly, uh, you know, as we think about 2019, we are starting, we've been so focused on uh, the getting the compact to where it is today that we have not focused uh, on implementation, but we know that we need to have a very strong implementation plan, and we know uh, that we will be working with, with everyone in this room uh, to, to make sure that the compact and all of the three Ps hold together. Uh, it's very important that all of these move together as a package and not uh, not separately. So we'll be working together uh, with with everybody to make sure that happens between now and September uh, when the bills um, get to the governor's desk. Um, we also know that the compact's going to change in ways that we don't have control over. It's a little bit of a sausage factory once it gets to Sacramento and uh, we know that, that that's going to happen, uh, but we want to be able to engage with all of you uh, in support of these bills and um, really appreciate everything uh, that you've done and hope to be able to share more thoughts uh, with you on that implementation as we move forward. And so with that, I think we're going to open up public comment, and Ken, do I hand that to you? Yes, thanks, Leslie. Ken Kirke, uh, Planning Director for MTC and ABEC. I have a lot of speaker cards, um, so we're going to ask people to speak for two minutes. Um, and the first speaker is, and I apologize in advance for any mispronunciations. I assure you there will be many. Uh, Robert Fruchtman, followed by Adam Nugent. And there's, uh, you can go to the podium on either the right or the left side. Hi, my name is Robert. 
I live in San Francisco's Lower Haight neighborhood, zip code 94117. I'm here because I'm selling my car. It's a white 10-year-old hatchback with great mileage. Now, to be clear, I'm not soliciting buyers. I'm telling you this because, in my experience, the cure for the common car is public transportation paired with housing and in concentrated doses. I've lived in San Francisco for almost six years. When I moved here, I drove here, and I kept my car thinking I would still need it. I was completely wrong. Six years later, I've spent too much money on car insurance, maintenance, registration, parking, and unleaded gas. I barely use it, and the reason I still have it is inertia. I ride SF Muni close to 365 days a year. Public transportation has been with me ever since I moved here. I've lived in Petro Hill, Central Soma, South Beach, Nopa, and Lower Haight. In all these neighborhoods, I've only needed public transit. And after I sell it, I will no longer be the outlier among my San Francisco friends. I had a while, I had to think a while about which of my friends still own a car. None of us is rich, and a car is a ridiculous expense here. It came to me just this morning, in a city like San Francisco, owning a car is a luxury of the rich and of the securely housed and of those who are not worried about greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions. But outside San Francisco, car ownership doesn't get any cheaper. Parking fees are replaced with greater maintenance and fuel costs because people drive longer to commute. Mega commuters are now a thing in almost every outlying county in the San Francisco Bay Area. UCLA professor of urban planning Donald Shoup has published research showing that poor and un underprivileged groups are less likely to own a car than the well-off because it costs thousands of dollars a year to maintain one. Let's reduce the reliance of San Francisco and the Bay Area on the automobile. Thank you. Thank you, Adam Nugent, followed by Wind Kaufman. Hi, I'm Adam Nugent. I'm a landscape architect from San Mateo. I'm also a former captain in the U.S. Army, an OEF vet. I am also an elder millennial. I'm hoping to become a father in the near future. Uh, and I had the fortune of studying and teaching in Germany in graduate school. Germany is a leader in sustainability. Uh, the quality of life there I saw was also night and day to what many people experience in the Bay Area. The U.S. has about two times the per capita carbon emissions as the U.K. and Europe. That's bad news for climate change, but I don't even need to go into that. Almost entirely due to the development pattern we have experimented, experimented with in the past 70 years. What else does that mean? Wealth of our citizens is drained into our high energy use and maintenance obligations of our streets and neighborhoods. This makes staving off financial and uh, municipal insolvency dependent on continued revenue growth. And Prop 13 was just a stopgap to keep that game running a li little longer. We think pensions are a problem. Since 1949, we have gone 10 times the amount of sewer pipe per capita in a typical American city. And yet, since that time, we've only uh, experienced 1.6 times the increase in wealth. That's from the Stanford University. We need to live in a different way, and people want to as well. This compact is our best hope of not leaving people behind in, this, uh, in breaking away from this long experiment. And it also helps us turn away from the radically prejudiced policies of the past. I support it. Thank you. Wynne Kaufman, followed by David Wu. Do I have to push this button? No. You're, you're OK. Good. My name is Wynne Kaufman. I am the vice president of AFT 2121, which is the faculty union at City College of San Francisco. We represent about 1,500 faculty, both full-time and part-time. And I am concerned that this compact does very little to address the housing needs of my constituency. Um, most of them are being priced out of San Francisco, and I see very little in this compact that will address that. I'm going to um, just concentrate on compact element number eight, which in the brief summary looks wonderful promote increased utilization of public land, 
surplus and underutilized for affordable housing through a variety of legislative and regulatory changes, as well as the creation of a new regional coordination and planning functions. So that sounds great, but then when you look at the desired effect, encourage the reuse of public land for creation of, and here it is, mixed use slash affordable housing by reducing barriers to development on public land. I'm very concerned about the term mixed use. First of all, public land should never leave public hands. Any kind of development on public land should be 100% affordable. So I really ask you to take into consideration people that are being priced out of San Francisco and this compact is not going to help. I also want to look around and wonder where the, the grassroots community housing organizations are at this table. Thank you. Thank you, David Wu, followed by Alfred Tfu, I believe. Hello, uh, David Wu. Um, I'm the community development coordinator with an organization called South Market Community Action Network, um, based in the South Market in San Francisco. And our organization um, directly organizes and serves uh, immigrant and low-income populations uh, in the South Market, um, with this particular focus on children, youth, and families. Uh, and in the South Market, uh, we've really seen and taken on the brunt of new development in San Francisco. Uh, and we're also really kind of ground zero for the tech boom and a lot of the gentrification and displacement crisis that is plaguing the entire city, but it really plays out strongly in the south of market. Um, and we've actually seen that the development um, priorities and plans both regionally and locally in San Francisco have exacerbated existing displacement, gentrification, eviction crises um, in the south of market and across the rest of the city. Um, so any um, kind of any CASA framework really must prioritize the on the ground realities of vulnerable communities in places such as the South Market, in places um, such as San Francisco. Without doing that, you will just uh, it will only continue to add to the problems. Um, we've seen a lot of. Um, so-called solutions that have been tried out in the South Market and have failed miserably uh, and really have increased displacement and gentrification pressures in the South Market, pushing out a lot of the folks that um, are hoping uh, that should hopefully benefit from any type of solution. So um, there must be really a strong do no harm policy to this, to existing communities. There cannot be a rollback of any existing protections that have been hard fought by the communities that you're looking to serve. And there must be real tenant protections now that can't come as an afterthought. Um, preservation and protections must be part of the package. Thank you. Alfred Tu sounded um, follow I'm sorry by Michelle Mashid. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Alfred. I live in Berkeley and I fart into San Francisco to work. And I'm here because we are in a housing crisis. I've seen my low income friends be priced out first from Oakland to Concord and most recently all the way out to Sacramento. And for the last few years, I've been fighting for rent control, for affordable housing, for increasing our housing supply. And I really like how. CASA ties in all these three things together. The one thing I would like to say is I'd like to echo the previous speaker's thought on the communities, uh, or the sensitive communities, the one on the second and the last page. It's kind of a patchwork, especially in San Francisco, and I think it's worth considering expanding that area and err on the side of including more areas within the protections of sensitive communities. But otherwise, this looks great. Please move it along. We can't wait that much longer. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, followed by Shajuti Hussain. Hi, my name is Michelle Majid from Urban Habitat and Six Winds. Um, so I want to start out by saying that CASA, as we've said all along, should be correcting for decades long race and class segregation by design. Our sole focus should be on breaking open exclusive communities by building housing at all income levels in these places, developing cool markets, not hot markets. There should be no upzoning and streamlining in sensitive, already gentrifying 
communities where low-income people and communities of colors are being priced out. We should be mitigating harm caused by unaffordable development in those neighborhoods. The geography, racial equity, and displacement impact analysis is still too fraught. Many neighborhoods throughout the region where working class communities and communities of color are, uh, live are being forced out, um, and they'll continue to be vulnerable because it's not lighting up, as you can tell by this map, right? Like, you see where sensitive communities are designated, and there's still almost 90%, if not more, of the region where they're not lighting up and should be. Uh, UC Berkeley's urban displacement project should serve as a base layer for this analysis. There should be an evenness in sustained funding and implementation at scale across the three Ps of tenant protections, affordable housing preservation, and affordable housing production. This should not be a zero-sum game. There's still too many unknowns, unknowns and sticking points and not enough guarantees in this compact. Um, and that we should be leading with a strong local and regional anti-displacement lens. Thank you. Thank you, Shijuti Hussain, followed by Victoria, Victoria Fierce. Hi, I'm Shijuti Hussain from Public Advocates. I'm excited to see this draft of the compact because it embraces uh, the tenant protections. It reflects a lot of great work on funding and regional entity, propo entity proposals. And the production proposals are moving in the right direction. Um, Thank you so much for your time and your work. But I also want to reemphasize the importance of a legislative drafting committee that can really iron out the details, um, especially on element seven on expedited approvals. This one stands out um, because it has a lot of details that cobble together many different pieces um, from earlier drafts. And a lot of those pieces could really undermine other elements in the compact. Um, for example, it allows a 35% density bonus on top of the streamlining. It undermines an environmental review and and identifies middle income as up to 150% AMI, which doesn't, uh, which isn't appropriate in many parts of the Bay Area. There also remains a lot of um, a lack of clarity on what this element intends to accomplish. So we recommend a separate grading gradient vote for this element, since there are so many um, concerns from a, from many from multiple sectors. So please take a second to revisit this element, and thanks again for your hard work. Thank you, Victoria Fierce, followed by Susan Kirsch. Hi, uh, my name is Victoria Fierce. Um, I live in downtown Oakland, um, and uh, I think the CASA Compact is a great thing, and we should really move forward with it. Um, I originally moved out here from Akron, Ohio, uh, July 5th, 2014, and uh, my hometown was dying. In the Midwest, we have a whole bunch of different problems that uh, San Francisco does not. For example, we don't have jobs. We have an abundance of housing, and that's great, and it was cheap, but there's not enough jobs to even pay the smallest rent. And those are pro and like the problems San Francisco has are things that my city would dream of having. Um, so I had to move out here because I needed to eat, right? You need to, you need to pay rent, you need to buy groceries, you need to fill this human body with things. So I moved to where my chosen family was, which was out here in San Francisco. It was specifically a couch in San Bruno. And I didn't plan on moving out here, but the job interview I originally flew out here for fell through, so I just didn't get on that airplane home that following Saturday. And I've been here kind of since then. And so anyways, once I finally had a job, I still needed to find an apartment. And the, the first apartment I looked for was on Craigslist, and I got on BART to get up to Oakland from San Bruno, and I get halfway there, and the person calls me and says, oh, I'm sorry, it's already been rented out. It was posted that morning. And that's when it really first hit me that the housing problem out here is like it's an actual big problem and we got to do something about this. And this was in 2014, years ago. And now here we are today talking about things like a regional housing development agency and, and statewide just cause. And like things have really changed for the better. We've made huge progress on these things, but like we need to do more. And this is a great start. And I think it's really important for everybody to understand that <laughs> This is a grand bargain in that we need to take this bargain so that we can build on it and go, better, go into the future. Because the housing crisis is a really big problem, and it's really hard to solve, but this compact makes solving it a lot easier. Thank you. Thank you. Susan Kirsch, followed by Scott Feeney. Hi, Susan Kirsch. I'm the founder of Livable California, and I want to start out just thanking all of you for the amount of work that you've done on this compact, and I still encourage you to vote against the compact. 
And I'll tell you a couple of reasons why I find weakness with the compact as I've read it and as I was in this chamber when the ABAG board met. Uh, so one of the problems is that you do not have representation from the majority of the 101 cities who should be engaged and involved around this compact. And at that ABAG board meeting, there was considerable alarm by the fact that this co the compact has moved forward without their input and some of the concerns about that. And I'll just name a couple of those. One is of the three Ps, which have wonderful alliteration, but the heavy emphasis is on production. 60% is on production, only 30% of this contract of the compact is on preservation or protection. For those people living in low income areas, that is far too low a percentage. The production we understand benefits those people who are building, but not necessarily those people who need affordable housing. The other part of this is the regional housing enterprise. Um, in some of the newspapers that I've read, the Bay Area News Group, for example, is concerned about that, as was the Marine Independent Journal, saying that that's pretty much a deal breaker. And when you have a body which is going to be draining off $1.5 billion a year from communities who have all of their own needs for infrastructure and count on that money, it's an irresponsible move to take that out of the hands of local agencies without them sitting at this table to be a part of deciding that. In addition, the plan to have an unelected board governing the regional housing enterprise is unacceptable. I urge you to vote no and oppose this compact. Thank you. Thank you, Scott Feeney, followed by Joy Lee. Okay, hi. Uh, hello, my name is Scott Feeney, and I'm really excited to offer my support for this compact that you all have put together. Um, I. It's really important that we do these three Ps of preser preserving, uh, protecting, and uh, production. Um, my personal story is that I moved here in 2014, and I'm one of the lucky ones because I had a job offer in hand that made it work. Um, but it's just too expensive here, and in the first year that I was here, only the first year, five of my new friends in San Francisco left because of high housing costs. And I don't even know that many people. <laughs> I also... I also have a close friend who fought eviction uh, from her apartment in San Francisco for several years, uh, was eventually able to prevail, uh, but only because San Francisco has strong tenant protections and she was able to access legal help, so I'm glad that this expands, uh, this compact would expand that to the rest of the Bay Area. Um, and then uh, the third story that I wanted to share with you is that I went to college in uh, Minneapolis, and I go back there a lot to meet friends who are still over there. And recently I was uh, meeting a young friend of a friend, and when I told her that I lived in San Francisco, she was completely amazed that I could afford to live in San Francisco. And she said, most of the people that I know that go out there uh, move to Oakland, and most of them come back pretty soon because they run out of money. So we really need more housing. We really need more protections for people who are already there. We really need preservation. I think this is a great compact that puts it all together, and I'm proud to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Joy Lee, followed by Peter Cohen. Hi, my name is Joy Lee. I'm with Housing Rights Committee of San Francisco, uh, our West Side office. So our West Side office has been organizing in Richmond since 2016, and we expanded to the rest um, of the West Side, including Sunset and Port Merced, um, since last year. So the west, the west side of San Francisco is increasing in density and seeing gentrification and displacement that has typically associated with other parts of the city um, that we call as the eastern neighborhood like uh, Mission and Soma. Rents are rising and so are evictions. Contrary to uh, perceptions of the west side of San Francisco, we're a neighborhood of renters, immigrants, communities of color, families, teachers, and at-risk populations. We are concerned that the current CASA compact would fuel market rate and unaffordable development on the west side without expanding opportunities to access this housing for our communities. And without incorporating a complex understanding of the hidden density and reality of San Francisco's marginalized communities. Incentivizing market rate development in the west side of San Francisco would only serve to harm our sensitive, at-risk, 
or marginalized communities by accelerating land speculation and intensify the pressure communities are already struggling against. Thank you. Thank you, Peter Cohen, followed by Fernando Marti. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Peter Cohen. I'm with the Council of Community Housing Organizations in San Francisco. Uh, I brought one handout to pass along the aisle. It's a map. Uh, I'm a geographer. And not everybody gets color because I don't have enough money. So you have to choose black and white or color. Um, you have a real monster here you're trying to wrestle. I think everybody has agreed that three Ps, the framing is good. It all gets down into the details and how to make these things work. Uh, and not have a grand bargain end up meeting, putting people at harm in order for uh, other folks to have benefits. That's a very difficult thing. I want to focus on two things. One is we really encourage you to make this an affordable housing focus. That is the tremendous need in the Bay Area. Whether that's very low income or middle income or everything in between, we have a wide range of folks in the Bay Area who are shut out of our private real estate market. If you look at ABAG's numbers for the last RENA cycle, 99% of the highest income category of RENA need was met, but only 24% of every other category, all the way up to 120% of AMI. Now that differs place to place, of course, because they have different markets. But the larger point is, we hope that the focus for CASA in this compact is to drive towards affordability at whatever points in the spectrum that is. Uh, whether that's streamlining, more sites, more funding, one footnote in, I think it's element number nine, where you're talking about splitting up money. A lot of member organizations in our coalition are now getting heavily into preservation work, and we think it has a lot of opportunity to scale. The preservation work group with uh, CHPC, uh, ABAG, NPH, and others did a lot of great data research, and there's hundreds of thousands of units around the Bay Area that right now have 80% AMI or lower households. If we can actually focus on that with money, we could get a lot. And second is geography. The map I passed you is from the planning department overlaying urban displacement pro uh, project from Berkeley. The map you have in your packet right now far under represents that map. And we ask you to really revisit. Sensitive communities is a core, core issue to making sure folks are not harmed. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando Marti, followed by Connie Ford. Good afternoon. My name is Fernando Marti with the Council of Community Housing Organizations. Um, so this is CASA, the Committee to House the Bay Area. And in our discussions uh, within our Six Wins for Equity network, we talked a lot about how we house the Bay Area. And we house the Bay Area with racial equity. We house the Bay Area within a frame of doing no harm, of protecting at-risk communities, and of breaking open those exclusionary communities that refuse to build housing at any income level. What I see here in the map that was published is that it is a map that says we are going to break open East Palo Alto to development. It is a map that says we are going to break open the low income areas of Santa Rosa and Sisun City to development. And we are going to break open most of the Mission District, which is already pretty broken open to development um, with these policies. It is not policies that say we are going to target cities like Lafayette, the down zone. We are not going to target Apollo Alto. We are not going to target Cupertino's and Brisbane's that approve commercial expansion without any housing to go along with it. So I think the framing somewhere in here has gotten lost about what it is that we are trying to do. One of the things that has been very disconcerting about this process has been that there is very little discussion, although it's been brought up a few times, around the difference between geographies that are hot markets San Francisco with 45,000 entitled units that do not have a building permit or areas of downtown San Jose where Spur San Jose recently published a paper saying there was a glut of approved luxury condos. Those are not the places that we need to be upzoning and streamlining. The places that we need to be looking at are those that have the possibility of replacing the suburban growth that ended in 2008. And that's what we all should be looking at. Thank you very much. Thank you. Connie Ford followed by Tess Wellborn. Good afternoon. My name is Connie Ford. Um, I'm the Vice President of the San Francisco Labor Council and representing Jobs with Justice, which is a coalition of labor and community groups fighting for social justice. Um, 
I applaud the work that's been going on here, and I thank you for all of the hard work. In particular, there's a call to action to grow and stabilize the construction labor forces. That's evident and prominent in what, what needs to happen. As long as you keep including those prevailing wages and those kind of codes there, that the workers will be treated fairly and provided with um, good wages. That's critical to this. I'm also wanting to talk to you just a moment about the workforce in San Francisco, for instance, since that's where I live. The workforce includes workers who make very low-waged workers. We have in-home health care workers in our unions, up to nurses and construction and um, beyond people who make up to 150% AMI. So it's critical when you talk about affordable housing, and affordable housing is key to all of this, is that you do it by layers and levels, and you include the very low and the middle and what we call the upper middle class folks, because workers who are making 100 to 150% AMI are leaving San Francisco just as fast as the low-waged workers. So that's the other thing. We're all for growth, we're all for um, expansion, but the workers have to be paid fairly and, and adequately, and you have, all of the levels of workers need to be included. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tess Wellborn, followed by Sonia Trous. Good afternoon. There are many good things and uh, many good tactics that are in these proposals here, but the process and the goal is what I would ask you to vote against. You're proposing a pact that would be controlled by an unelected board, and that board would be controlled by an other unelected body, the MTC. This is not a democratic process. My, um, I live in San Francisco where I have been a housing advocate for many years. We need more housing in San Francisco. Like Boston, we've been building quite a bit of luxury housing, and like Boston, about two-thirds of it is vacant. I would like to say that another thing about the compact as you have it, where's climate change? Where's transportation? You should have a billion dollars in here for transportation a year. You're proposing to relocate low-income communities, uh, well, actually, people, you're not going to relocate the communities. And there's no replacement for all of the ties that communities make. The neighbor who will babysit or take care of your plants and your cat and dog. But you don't have that in here. The whole package shouldn't move forward together because, again, we need the democratic process in here. Taking it to the legislature where votes are controlled by real estate interests, well, you know, what? Ameri uh, citizens of California should have a bigger say than folks who can make a dollar off of this. I would also ask that you look at any housing built on public land to be 100% affordable and owned as social housing, owned by the community, not developers. Sonia Tr Thank you. Sonia Trous followed by Tim Frank. Hi, my name is Sonia Trous. I live in Somo right now. Um, I've been organizing for housing since 2014 when I lived in West Oakland. Uh, I think that we are in a housing shortage, and I think the shortage affects renters the most. If you're a homeowner, shortage is not really a problem for you. But if you're a renter, you're not housing secure, then shortage is a huge problem. And so that's why when we talk about the three Ps, production is a kind of protection. Production does protect people against being displaced. I mean, being displaced is the difference between the amount of housing we have and the amount of housing we need. Um, so when I started organizing, I was living in West Oakland, and I started organizing because people were being displaced from San Francisco. They were moving to West Oakland. They were driving rents up there. And I realized that displacement isn't something that happens once, that the displaced from one neighborhood become gentrifiers in the next neighborhood, and then people displaced from, you know, from West Oakland were going to East Oakland, East Oakland to Concord, and so on. So, it's, so the decisions made in any part of the Bay affect every other part of the Bay. And so that's why, actually, I think, yeah, you should go ahead with this all together, because what's the point of having all of these meetings and having a big compromise if now you break it up? There's, that would be a step backwards. Um, but also, I really want to uh, speak in favor of doing it this way, taking out 
the so-called direct uh, democracy representation. Because honestly, the way that we've been doing it for the last 30 years is not democratic, and it has not resulted in what we need, which is an adequate, um, uh, adequate supply of housing. Uh, we've tried it the old way, and the old way is every little town making their own decisions and weighing in. We've done that, and what is the result? The result is a crippling housing shortage. So I don't think people can, with a straight face, really argue that that's a good method. It's a terrible method. The other reason that it's a bad method, oh, is that it's hard, to, it's hard for the whole region to weigh in when you're making decisions bit by bit. Thank you. Thank you. Tim Frank, followed by Josh Geyer. Good afternoon. I'm Tim Frank, and I'm the executive director of the Center for Sustainable Neighborhoods. <coughs> the issues that are our top priorities are climate change, the housing crisis, and the low-wage uh, worker crisis. And you have the ability with this compact, with a few amendments, and we would suggest some amendments, to actually do something important for all three of those. Um, somebody earlier said that 60% uh, of the elements were aimed at the production issue, but I would argue that the uh, uh, elements aimed at production are actually, some of them, not complete. And that for this uh, compact to get the job done, you'll need to make sure that we're using every tool that's available to help build a skilled and trained workforce is actually utilized for that purpose. This is actually important both for uh, the, the production uh, challenge because we really can't double the amount of uh, production in the Bay Area unless we double the size of the skilled and trained workforce to do that work. And because it's critically important that this industry actually address its own low wage crisis. 40% of uh, uh, residential construction workers in California make a low wage. And this, these are disproportionately uh, people of color and especially Latino to the extent that 20% of all Latino men actually are uh, construction workers. So there's something we can do about this to fix the compact, to make sure that it's on point in this regard, and that is to make sure that as you look at uh, compact elements four, five, and six, that they actually include the type of uh, requirements that you've built into compact elements uh, uh, seven and eight. That's the, 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 uh, uh, the transit and the public lands piece. Now, number four is a little bit complicated, and I only have two minutes, so I won't have a chance to, to really work through the details there. Five, I think, should be pretty much self-explanatory. If you look at six, you've got um, the restrictions on fees, and you've got uh, uh, restrictions on down zones. Please wrap it up. We have quite a few more speakers. These could be actually structured as tools to encourage the use of skilled and trained workers, and actually we think that that would be a, the right thing to do. Thanks. Thank you. Josh Geyer, followed by Jerry Drattler. Hi. Uh, name is Josh Geyer. Um, I found out about this this morning. I was working from home in the East Bay, but I decided it was important that I come over here and speak up in favor of this compact. Uh, the housing shortage in the Bay Area uh, is more than any other area in the country, really, as a slow-moving or not slow-moving disaster for um, primarily low-income people, but also mi middle-income people. Um, people are being displaced uh, out to the suburbs, these mega commuters, out to other, other areas of the country uh, when they'd rather be here, where the jobs are, where their friends are. Um, the, it, it pains me that, um, that people, the people who come up here representing um, communities that have been historically disadvantaged, like communities of color, like poor people, like, like other marginalized people, um, see uh, new housing production as a threat, even though I completely understand being skeptical of, of new development because um, those same communities have been shafted many, many times by people who want something from them, which is the right to build, uh, and don't want to give something back. So I understand the skepticism. But it pains me that there's, 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 so, much, there's so much skepticism because every, every problem that – every group that's on the wrong side of a power dynamic everywhere, but especially here, is uh, the, the housing shortage makes that problem worse for them. Housing shortage makes uh, – if you're having a hard time finding an apartment because you're disabled, uh, the housing shortage hurts you. If you're, finding a, a hard, if you're having a hard time finding an apartment because you, have, uh, you, you need a certain number of bedrooms, like f four bedrooms or five bedrooms, the housing shortage hurts you. 
The only way to get out of the hole that has been caused by this housing shortage that, that's been created by individual governments all over the Bay Area for decades is to build more housing everywhere, everywhere that's sustainable and has transportation now and, and for every year going into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry Drettler, followed by Ozzy Roan. My name is Jerry Drattler. I'm a member of the San Francisco Land Use Coalition. I've lived in the Richmond District of San Francisco for 33 years. The plan focuses on increasing housing debt. Having a job and housing balance. We're interested in making things right in communities that are being displaced on a daily basis. And this plan does not address that. Well, I can see because you guys are probably not in touch with these communities. Um, I could understand why someone like Sonia Trials would come here and poo-poo the democracy for somebody who didn't win a democratic election. I could understand that. But it's not okay for us to actually poo-poo the democracy that is going to bring governments, elected officials that are going to be accountable to us and accountable to the needs of our community. Um, the transit-oriented development is another boondoggle that everybody's latching on without any data that is going to support uh, whether or not this is going to be good for the environment. When you are displacing people that are, cannot live in these transit-oriented developments because of the cost, you are actually adding to the environmental crisis that we are going through because they will have to schlep from Stockton to here. So um, I think you've heard my opposition loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. Jordan Grimes, followed by Ken Bukowski. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jordan Grimes. Um, I was born and raised in San Mateo uh, and still live there uh, with my parents and my sister, uh, who is a few years younger than myself, because neither of us can afford to move out. That's just the reality that most, um, most kids who grew up in the Bay Area face. And there's been a lot of discussion about San Francisco today, so I sort of want to move down a little bit to uh, San Mateo County, uh, where I'm from. And I'm mostly going to wing this, so please bear with me. Um, one of the things uh, I'd like to mention is that my city of San Mateo, in the last three decades, has built only 3,500-ish units of housing. Um, at the same time, job growth has been enormous. Uh, the three decades before that, by the way, we built 14,000 units of housing. So you can see that there's been a, a massive drop off. Um, I strongly uh, support the, the CASA Compact uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, there are things that I wish were a little bit different in it. I wish some of the tenant protections were, were stronger. Um, I'm a big advocate for rent control. And unfortunately, in San Mateo County, uh, there's really only one city that uh, has even uh, somewhat adequate tent protections, and that's uh, East Palo Alto. Um, but I really think the CASA Compact could, could do a lot of good um, in, in our county, uh, specifically in regard to uh, upzoning the wealthier cities uh, in San Mateo County, like mine. Um, I also think it could do a lot of good uh, with the just cause uh, protections for tenants, as well as uh, the uh, protections um, for uh, Sorry, the uh, uh, attorney, uh, the right to legal counsel, excuse me. Um, there, uh, there are so many tenants in San Mateo County uh, who live without those protections. Um, and I think this goes a long way to making our county, which has historically been exclusionary, uh, more, more equal to all. Thank you. Thank you. Ken Bukowski followed by Teresa, I believe, Flanditch. We have a major problem with displacement. Well, that's caused by the flood of new jobs. Well, if a water pipe broke and you wanted to control it, you would shut off the water. But there's no, no mention about curtailing the amount of new jobs that are being created. So every time you create a new job, you displace somebody. And what does that mean for a city? Then you've got homeless people, you've got crime, you've got a whole host of expenses that, that no one's addressing. You've got new housing, that costs cities money too. And how is that being addressed? There's no money to pay for the services that the new housing requires. So I think we've got a long way to go. I don't think this is ready yet. And shoving it down the throat of the cities isn't going to work. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa, followed by Milo Trouse. 
I'm Teresa Flandrick. I work at Senior and Disability Action. I'm also a four decade long resident of North Beach, San Francisco. Um, I have watched my community become so diminished in terms of the number of evictions. The seniors that I represent in my work as well um, cannot afford to be forced out of their homes and go anywhere anymore. So when you have a, an income that is less than 50% of area median income because the median incomes have changed over time, um, this is a population that is truly hurting. They are our retired workforce. So there's a lot of <clears throat> talk today about the workforce. There's also the retired workforce that will be growing in numbers. In 2030, we will have 30% of the population of San Francisco being seniors. So we need affordable housing. We need to, number one, protect our, our tenants. Um, two thirds of the population in North Beach are renters. We need to make sure that we continue our community so that people can remain in their homes, in their city where they have the health care that they need and have had over years with the same physicians, etc. They need above all the social network that we all need in, in communities. So to build affordable housing that's truly affordable, but to strengthen all rental protections for everyone in the Bay Area. Thank you. Thank you, Milo Trous, followed by Brendan Adams. Hello, my name is Milo Trous. I live in West Oakland. Um, and I want to, uh, first of all, support this grand comeback. I, I, I commend uh, so many people from different parts of the region coming together and putting heads together to think in a big picture way how the entire region can solve our problems. Uh, with an abundance of jobs and a shortage of housing and how do we get ourselves out of this mess and go in a new direction different from what we've been doing in the past that has not been working for so many people. So one, regionalism is a good thing. You know, everything, you know, as other speakers have said, housing that we don't build on the west side of San Francisco has to be built somewhere uh, to get workers to their jobs. Um, so sustainability and density near transit, element five. That's good. I would like to see that expanded um, so that we can have more density closer to jobs and uh, take advantage of some, you know, bike share, scooter share, things that expand just beyond a quarter of a mile, um, but a half a mile or a mile from so transit areas. Um, and also disposal of public life. land for Please public profit. So. Uh, that's another one of the, the, the calls to action. Um, there's no reason why municipalities can't uh, harness the hot housing market for uh, revenue for municipalities to then reinvest in housing. So mixed income public projects could be a real boon. And I think that kind of works with the, re the call for redevelopment 2.0. Um, and I understand that there's some funding structures already that exist where with, with low income housing projects and, and cities get a check, you know, every month of a share of the profit. But I think there's a lot of potential there that we can unlock um, if we change the caps on low income housing tax credits and other sorts of state funding. Thank you. Thank you. Brendan Adams followed by Laura Foote. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brendan. Um, I'm a graduate student at Berkeley, uh, and I'm a third generation Californian. I say that not to um, fetishize my experience or say that my opinion is worth more than anybody else's who may be a newcomer to our area. I say that because I'm the only member of my family left in the state. Um, and that makes me really sad. Uh, the reason I'm here today is because I want to echo what the previous commenters uh, said and really support the regionalism of this plan. I think that you all have done a really good job um, of making a start um, to fix this, this crisis. Um, I, people I've heard say that regionalism is not representative. And I just don't understand that perspective because to me what we have today is the antithesis of representation. This concern for displaced communities paired with this idea that these people who've been forced out of San Mateo or San Francisco now only have a right to express their opinion on projects in Fairfield and Modesto and are now completely separated from where they once were, it's just not logical. Um, so I, I, I want to close and say that um, 
there comes a point where rejecting proposals because they're not exactly what we want becomes a defense of the status quo. And the status quo is obviously a state that has resulted in despair for a lot of people. I think the three Ps are the right framework, and I think that you all have done a really good job, and I hope that we don't let perfect become the enemy of good. Thank you. Laura Foote, followed by Bruce Bowen. Hi, Laura Foote. Um, I'm going to start with a letter that I got from Angela Hawk about. Um, Angela says she was displaced by a landlord due to a $450 rent increase in 2013. It was devastating to me and my family that we could not afford adequate housing with my husband's well-paying job. At the time, I was a stay-at-home mother whose income would have gone completely to childcare if I went back. Uh, by, um, to this day, I still do not trust landlords, especially since we lack fair government protections at our local level. Fortunately, we were the lucky ones. We moved in with my mother-in-law and shared a four-bedroom house. I was so lucky that we could continue to consolidate housing to make room for others with our limited housing inventory. So many others aren't so lucky. She thinks she's lucky. So many others have to leave their beloved communities or worse, become homeless. Shortly after we moved, I started the Alameda's Renters. Um, she goes on to say, and I'm going to forward this to you, that she's tearfully happy to read CASA's report and to see a comprehensive plan to address the many issues that have led to the Bay Area's housing shortage. So congratulations, you brought people to tears. Um, many people are thrilled that you guys have managed to do uh, something magical, um, bring together a commitment to dramatic funding sources for affordable housing, to tenants protections, and to a commitment to build the amount of housing that we think is dramatically needed. Those three components need to stay together. If we lose one of those components, we will not be dealing with this problem holistically. Um, it's a really amazing opportunity to be able to say we're committing to both protecting people where they are now, making more opportunities so people can move up the housing ladder, ladder and also to get a lot of money for subsidized affordable housing. Please don't lose that vision. Thank you. Thank you. Bruce Bowen followed by Kevin Burke, and that is the last public speaker card that I have. Thank you. Bruce Bowen from... I'm Bruce Bowen from the Dolores Heights Improvement Club and the San Francisco Land Use Coalition. I'm here to briefly defend the idea of democratic input in particular and even a direct democratic input. I think that more democratic input needs to be provided in this project in order to ensure that outreach and communication is adequate and engagement with all communities who are going to be affected or even affected positively, neg uh, negatively or devastated by this, by this effort. I know a lot of, uh, of good input has been provided. Whether or not it's communi uh, community-based and democratic, I guess I would just have to say we just don't believe. We don't necessarily believe that the, it's adequately democratic, has, ha has had adequate analysis, and will the impact among all of our communities has been adequately uh, understood. We just don't believe it yet. I hope at some point we can, but we don't believe it now. Thank you very much. And the last speaker is Kevin Burke. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Kevin Burke. I have grew up in the Bay Area. I grew up in Alamo. I've lived here in the Bay Area my whole life. Uh, my brother and sister are gone. My fiance's sister is gone. Uh, the best man at my wedding are gone. More of my friends are probably going to go when they have kids. Uh, maybe five out of 200 people in my middle school class can afford to live in the area. Um, I don't know one person. I know one person my age who's bought a house without help from her parents. Uh, that house was in Houston. Um, I live in San Mateo. I live in San Mateo County now. Um, rich people are going to move to San Mateo County, whether we build new housing or not. Um, we've tried not building housing in San Mateo County for the last decade. Just uh, oh, just about 5,000 new housing units across the whole county for the whole for the last decade. Um, the result is rents have doubled. San Mateo County has eight times as much land. It has built about a quarter of the housing that San Francisco has built. That's worked out really well for older homeowners and really poorly for everyone else. Uh, I pay $3,300 a month to rent an apartment where the hot water doesn't work consistently. Um, I can afford that, but a lot of people can't, um, and the people that can't are getting displaced. We used to build a lot of housing in the 70s and 80s, and then we stopped doing that. Um, we need to get back to building that level of housing and legalizing housing. Um, if the cities aren't interested in doing that, then I think it's appropriate for regional governments to step in. Um, 
Finally, I'd say this is a public health issue. Uh, in Belmont, where I live, 88% of the housing stock was built before 1990. That means there are a ton of people living in housing that is not safe in an earthquake, that is not safe against a fire, that is not ADA compliant, um, that does not have all of the nice things that new housing has. Um, and we need to get more people living in newer housing stock that does have those, uh, that does have the better construction guarantees um, and won't fall apart the next time there's a big quake. Thanks very much for all of your help and all of your work on this issue. That's it. Thank you. That was the last speaker. All right, thank you. And let me just say um, thanks to those who have taken the time to uh, provide the cu uh, public comment. I think uh, what we heard uh, really adequately, uh, appropriately reflects both the, the complexity of this issue and the urgency that people uh, feel behind it. I think I want to turn it over to Mike now, who's going to um, introduce Steve, who's going to walk us through where we are. Thanks, Fred. Uh, I got to say, that was really um, good to hear. The passion that's out there, both for and maybe not 100% against, um, I think is indicative of the fact that when this group got together early on, we started off with a question that said, does anybody think we don't have a housing crisis? And of course, nobody raised their hand. So in those 18 months we've been working, this group, which I believe has a pretty good representation of all the elements that are in the three Ps, has been working tirelessly to uh, find its way through a path that would combine and include the best of the best, the best protections, the best preservations and production, which we also believe includes the entire spectrum of the missing middle income, affordable, um, et cetera. So um, today, as you heard, we're going to uh, do a vote. And the reason we're doing that is because it, you have to appreciate the technical committee was put together as a, a large group of representative folks who have skills. They know how to do housing. They know how to do um, protection issues. They know all these things. They're sitting in front of you. and by by getting them into a room and having to negotiate none of us have ever done this before N nobody has ever put all these disparate views in one room and said here go make a deal so the pluses and the minuses the ads the deletes the f improper phrasing that might slip out on the 48th redraft um, has never been our intention we have been working to come up with the fundamental tenant that this region, Northern California, is in a crisis. We put a 15-year uh, moniker over the top of it. We said it's a 15-year solution. We weren't trying to solve for infinity. And, and I think what you have today for the technical committee's vote is um, a package that will go from here, probably with some modifications in the next week or two, to the steering committee, as you heard, and then the legislature. And so the legislature is going to be representing this compact in a hopeful combined way, like we talked about, where all the issues go together. You can't pull them apart. And so um, as we ask the technical committee to vote today, there, there's been some nuance issues of whether or not I represent the city of San Francisco, if I'm here for San Francisco, or do I represent the entire unions sitting here as a technical committee advisor? And what I would hope is that each of us looks at the group that you're with, looks at the commitment we've made to work towards these nuances and can find out a way to push this compact through the process. And so the voting you've heard in the past is the gradients of, of agreement. There are four votes that say the following. Number one, I'm really pleased to support the decision. Number two, I'm mostly satisfied and I can support it. Number three, I'll go along with it, kind of a ho-hum, yes. Um, number four, I have serious reservations. Okay, we respect that. But because we're focused on the needs of the region and we're compromising for the greater good, um, I will vote for it. And then number five is, I can't see doing this. And number five is, is a very stressful thing for the co-chairs. Um, we have been working day and night with the members of this committee to have... Um, consensus so that when we send it to the steering committee that they uh, take this with seriousness that they and many of the speakers spoke the words I was going to say you stole my let not perfection be the enemy of the good uh, this compact is not perfect it will never be perfect 
It won't be perfect when it gets through the steering committee. It won't be perfect when it gets through the legislation. But it will be a direction that we believe the Bay Area needs. We are not performing to the level of those three Ps, not even close. So um, when you get to the vote, what I ask all the technical committee members is to think about those things, think about the package, and if you have to vote against your boss, I'm okay with that. <laughs> because your boss hasn't been in the room for 18 months. Your boss hasn't been here, and he's not being or she's being asked to vote on this package. So when the steering committee shows up, there's another conversation that'll go on. I hope many of you show up for that because that's um, the, the legislative folks from the Bay Area who will be there and, and voice those same opinions, um, um, hopefully the good ones and, and even the challenging ones we, we appreciate. So with that, I'm going to let Steve walk through the final parts and then we've got some the uh, equity conversation to go through and then we'll finally get to the vote. Thank you. Uh Mike and uh, technical committee members, uh, after 18 months, uh, you've put together a pretty big body of work. And I think what we've got now is a Casa Grande. Um, and so, uh, because the house has grown so large, I've been appointed to sort of walk you through the rooms and make sure you remember stuff you've already seen. And m most of you have seen most of this already, but also to alert you to the fact that you haven't seen it all and to where the new stuff is. Um, one thing we've got is a cover, and I think the subtitle on the cover really hits the three notes that Mike was just hitting, um, that the CASA Compact is a 15-year emergency policy package to confront the housing crisis in the San Francisco Bay Area. So it's, it's a 15-year emergency. It's right now, and we need to do something to cope with the level of emergency we have. Secondly, that it's a package, again, that the elements are supposed to be sticking together and sticking with each other under the rubric of the three Ps that we've been using all the way through. And third, that it's about the Bay Area. Um, and look, I'm the transportation guy in the room, and we're used to looking down at L.A. and saying, well, at least we're not as bad as them. Um, well, guess what? On housing, we're a lot worse than they are. We're a lot worse than just about anywhere else in the United States. Um, and I think that justifies uh, taking bold action uh, to try to address our problem. So that's the cover. You now have a cover. Uh, you also have, uh, right uh, after the cover, a preamble. And uh, one thing we've also added at the end of your document is some calls to action, things that need to happen that aren't necessarily within the four corners of the compact. I would call this preamble more like your call to arms. Uh, the fact that we do have such a significant problem and the fact that we need to take strong measures to address it. Uh, the two numbers that keep sticking in my head in this preamble are the fact that since the end of the Great Recession, we've added over 700,000 jobs in this region, which is a great problem to have, uh, but we've only built a little over 100,000 housing units. And that is the problem, in my opinion, in a nutshell. Uh, after the preamble, there is an introduction, uh, and this is probably as good a place as any to thank all of you for your role in developing this, especially our working group moderators uh, who have been working, I think, much more for CASA than they have on their day jobs, uh, and we really appreciate the work they've done. Uh, this lays out in the introduction in page five and six how that work has progressed over uh, the 18 months and all the ground that we have covered. The first three elements, uh, and you'll notice in the introduction, in the in, rather in the in the table of contents, we've grouped uh, the ten elements into uh, places where we thought they hung together the best. The first three elements are dealing with tenant protection, uh, and I think you'll notice that these have been fairly stable for many many months now, uh, and I think that tells me they've got some staying power because we probably landed on the right ideas. Uh, to start with. The other ideas have been moving in and out uh, with a lot more mobility, uh, but these three have stayed put. Uh, the first one on just cause eviction, the second on some kind of rent cap to deal with the emergency we're in, and the third on emergency rental assistance and access to legal counsel. Uh, just to point one thing out in uh, compact element number two, you'll see some ranges. And this isn't the only place in the compact that you see some ranges. And that obviously reflects, in some cases, uncertainty about what the right answer is. 
Uh, it reflects in other cases perhaps some disagreement about where the right answer is in those ranges. Uh, and again, I don't think it's going to be the end of the world to send a few ranges to Sacramento and let some smarter heads up there think them through and figure out where we ought to land as well. One point to make about Compact Element 3, and this is a case where we've received some input from the steering committee, um, there are two ideas in play here. One is uh, the notion of providing access to counsel to folks who are facing eviction. The other is, is there a way to provide emergency rent assistance to those folks? Because I think we heard from Jackie, at least in San Jose, that you know something like 90% of the evictions are for non-payment of rent. And the advice we got uh, from a couple of our steering committee members, especially Mayor Schaff and Mayor Licardo, is they'd rather be spending money on emergency rent assistance and keep the person in the house uh, or apartment rather than spending it on lawyers to keep them, <laughs> to try to get them back in. Uh, so uh, that, I think, is how you see it drafted uh, before you today. I'll also note on these three, uh, something you also have that's new is with each compact item, you've got a map or a chart or a graphic. And uh, I will say that I'm one of those people who tends to think easier in pictures than words, uh, even though I'm an English major. That's a weird confession. Uh, but uh, I hope some of you are as well, and I hope these, these maps help you uh, in thinking through some of the issues that are raised. Um, the fourth one uh, and the next series uh, after compact element number four are sort of on the production and preservation side of the ledger. Uh, this one's about ADUs, which a lot of people seem to like, so I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, and uh, on item number five, I, I, I do want to mention a couple of things here, uh, because this one uh, has seen some significant change, as has compact element number seven. On number five, um, I, I think the issue here uh, with respect to Senate Bill 827, uh, because this, this element is, is responding to the debate on that bill earlier in the year, is the fact that the state, I think pretty strongly now, is, is asserting its interest in delivering on the investment it's made in public transit in our major urban areas around California. And they've made a big investment. And I think what they're looking for is the value of that investment being realized in ridership. And all the academic research suggests that if people live near transit, they are much more likely to use it. Um, this is not a new idea. Uh, over 10 years ago, MTC adopted a policy that requires local communities, if they seek our discretionary funding, to upzone around those transit corridors. That was 12 years ago. Um, so what the legislature is doing is picking up on that thread. Um, what you have here in the map is a map of the Bay Area with the rail and ferry stops included. Now what's not included are the bus stops, and the bus stops and how you define them and which buses should be in and which should be out, I think that will be a matter for legislative debate, but we wanted to show you at least the places where I think there is common ground, and that is you should define transit at least as rail and ferry. What we've also included here, and I think it's worth pointing out because some of the other maps have the, the sensitive communities outlined as well, I think you can see them the best here on this particular map, which is on page 16. We've also got three insets for the three large cities. Um, and you've heard quite a bit of public testimony today about the maps. And I will say there are lots of different ways you could draw a map in the Bay Area. And I think over the last several months, we've been through quite a few of them. Um, and it's fair to say, based upon what you've heard today, uh, especially that we really haven't landed on a consensus map. Uh, I'll add yet, because I certainly don't give up hope that we can. And we're certainly open to additional mapping exercises to try to identify these sensitive communities in the most appropriate way possible. The map we have used, though, is reliant on three publicly adopted maps that the MTC, that the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, and that the Bay Conservation and Development Commission have adopted. Each of those agencies has adopted a map of disadvantaged communities. And the map that we used represents an intersection of those three maps. Again, a uh, perfect enemy of the good. I don't have a perfect map in front of you either. Uh, but the map we do have shows you uh, the intersection of those areas 
uh, with these rail and ferry networks. And it also accompanies the idea that I think uh, this committee has trailblazed, and that's the question of some kind of deferral period for those sensitive areas so that they have time for additional uh, public uh, consensus building, for community engagement, for planning in those areas, and uh, don't go as fast as some of the other communities in the Bay Area. So is there room for improvement on the map? There certainly is. You'll hear uh, from uh, Vikrant Sud later on about uh, the, the, the makings of the map and how we've applied it, uh, but I wanted to point it out to you here. Uh, compact element six, I think, is, is about process, uh, and it's about trying to make the process a little more rational uh, and a little less lengthy. And so you will see uh, quite a few references to standardizing impact fees, standardizing inclusionary zoning, standardizing downzoning and moratoria. Uh, again, not so much the point here of you shouldn't be able to do this, but it should bear some rational relationship to what your neighbor does. Um, so that there is more of a level playing field around the region. Uh, compact element seven, uh, again here I think it's helpful to look at the graphic as a way of depicting what we're focused on here, which is the so-called missing middle. We're using the RENA categories here, which I know is not a perfect surrogate for that question. Um, but what I think it does show quite clearly is that even though we're sort of performing at what Rena says we ought to do with market rate, um, we're way below on low income, but we're even worse on a percentage basis with, with the moderate category. Um, and so this idea here is trying to improvise uh, or innovate rather, I think, because the re legislature never improvises, they write it down. But it's trying to innovate um, on the SB 35 construct, which sort of has this, you know, no SB 35 and SB 35 streamlining path, and I think this idea here is looking for a third way through that, uh, largely relying uh, on uh, fiscal incentives and on CEQA relief uh, as well, and also trying to preserve uh, a, a, an appropriate level of local discretionary review of these projects as well. So it's, it's working within those boundaries and trying to find some additional space uh, to create this missile, missing middle housing uh, by, by creating new provisions in state law. Element number eight is on public lands. You've heard quite a bit, I, I think, of commentary on that today, and that's good to hear. But I, I think one thing that people often, you talk to them at, at the party or at, at the corner uh, uh, market is, you know, well, where are we going to get the land? Well, why don't we start with land the public already owns? And some work that MTC and ABAG did here shows you in your chart uh, that quite a bit of that land is near public transit, and quite a bit of that land, not surprisingly, is owned by public transit agencies. Um, and so we think that's a pretty good place to start. And the ideas here in compact element number eight are a whole series of, of moving that ball down the field, including trying to get the state agencies involved in practicing what they preach. Nine and, two, uh, nine and ten I'll talk about together because they really belong together. Uh, number nine is the part of the agenda where we've got to turn our attention to funding. And the fact is a number of the protection ideas I talked about cost money. Uh, the streamlining ideas we hope won't cost much money. They ought to save us some money, in fact, especially for local government. Um, but the notion of affordable housing and subsidizing its construction, uh, the notion of preservation of existing housing and subsidizing that activity uh, takes a lot of money. In fact, our estimate is region-wide, we're two and a half billion dollars short. Now that's huge, that's per year too. That's not once, that's every year. Uh, now the first thing we did is say, the first thing you did is say, well, we can't, we can't swallow all of that at once. Um, what about the federal government? What about the state government? And so the assumption in this, in this compact item is that one and a half billion would, we would try to generate here in the Bay Area through what we've, what we've sort of analogized is a self-help movement for housing, just as we've done it for transportation. So the idea is if we can ask the federal and state government to, co to cover about a billion, we would try to cover through that self-help movement about a billion and a half. 
what we've developed in the graphic, and you've seen this, I think, many, many times, it's just, it's just fluctuated in terms of the number of boxes. What we've developed is a menu for the legislature to continue, for the, for the legislature to consider, and that menu uh, is not intended to implement each one of these boxes. It's intended to ensure that we spread the responsibility for raising this revenue among various sectors in the economy. We don't all load it up on the developers or on the business community or on the taxpayer, uh, that we all try to help shoulder some of this load, just as we would with the federal and state government. We also include here, there is quite a bit of detail about the allocation formula. If you were able to raise that kind of money, uh, what would you spend it on? Uh, as well as some return to source requirements uh, in terms of if the money is generated uh, in the nine counties of the region, what, what share of that do they get back at a minimum? I will also note here that there are, there's a labor standards provision here uh, and there are labor standards provisions sprinkled throughout the document there in differing shapes and sizes. And my sense is that's one that we probably have to talk about maybe a little bit more uh, going ahead in the next few months and weeks, and that's okay too. Um, but I just want to alert you to the fact that, uh, that that flavors a lot of the proposals that are in the document. And finally, if you're going to raise all that kind of money, you've got to give it to somebody to administer. Um, and the fact is we really today don't have a regional entity that's capable of doing so. Um, and so the 10th the compact element would create one. Uh, the working title right now is a regional housing enterprise. It would not have, I want to emphasize, land use authority. It would not have regulatory authority. Uh, its intent is to provide us uh, benchmarks and data on how we are doing and its intention is to administer the revenue, and that might involve debt financing, it might not, but the idea is for that money uh, to be spent on the activities that support the compact. Uh, there has been, I think, some commentary today about the fact that such an entity would not be directly elected. Um, the fact is there is only one directly elected board at a regional level in America, in Portland. Uh, the very common model is to have indirect representation through local elected officials, they're elected to their day job, and they're appointed by their fellow local elected officials to the board. One of the innovations that this compact item suggests is including some representatives from the private sector, sort of mimicking the stakeholder basis that, that CASA was developed uh, to, to, to cover, and perhaps include those individuals on the board as well. So that's a quick uh, busman's holiday tour through uh, the uh, 10 items. I will note on pages 27 and 8, there are five calls to action uh, that I mentioned earlier on redevelopment, on lowering the vote threshold for housing, which I sense is going to be a little harder to pass than transportation, um, on dealing with the fiscalization uh, of Prop 13, on homelessness, and the homelessness section goes into quite a bit of detail about how the individual items in the compact will help with the homelessness problem. They were not specifically designed to do so, but there's going to be a lot of co-benefit, we think, uh, between this agenda and the homelessness agenda. And finally, a call to action on growing and stabilizing the construction labor force, uh, because not only will it take a lot of money to carry this agenda out, it's going to take a lot of labor to carry this agenda out. Um, and we need to make sure we're hitting on all cylinders there as well. Finally, let me mention, you do have on pages 29 and 30 uh, a, a best practice uh, prototype, I guess I would call it, um, and this one pertains to the, the, the fire response, and in particular, there is a very interesting experiment in good government, I would call it, uh, that's underway right now, and in fact, fact, I think it's supposed to be approved this month, a joint powers agreement between the county of Sonoma and the city of Santa Rosa to fashion something like what CASA is suggesting for the region in that part of our Bay Area uh, to deal with the fire damage that they've seen and the recovery efforts that they're going to need to mount. Our intention is to get quite a few more examples of best practice because there is a lot of innovation going on right now in local government all over the Bay Area, and we want to lift those up. Uh, we think we obviously need more than best practices uh, to get the job done, but I think it's important to give credit where credit is due, and I think there is quite a lot of credit to be done uh, in the Bay Area with our local government partners.
So I think uh, Mike or Fred, uh, I'm turning it back to uh, one of you uh, to keep us going. Or, um, That's your Steve, I'm, I'm looking uh, at the clock and we've got about 25 minutes left, which means that we're not going to be able to do justice to the uh, third in agenda item around equity. Can you just mention what is in there um, just really briefly? And I think that we'll have to um, kind of come back to it when we get to the steering committee level. I don't think that we ever intended for the group to vote on that. So I think we're okay there, but I do want to make sure people know what what is Thank what you, basically uh, Fred. it is. Thank you, Fred. And so let me just emphasize a couple of things. The first uh, is to emphasize that this is work done by MTC ABAG staff. This has not yet been vetted by the CASA Enterprise. Uh, you were all very busy trying to get the compact concluded. Uh, and so I want to emphasize where the authorship lies. Um, I think you will see throughout the document that is in your packet that we are trying to use the map that I described earlier to assess the racial and economic impacts of this, of this set of proposals on the communities in the Bay Area and especially uh, the sensitive communities as we've identified them. We've, we've identified five different uh, criteria or values or goals, one being access to opportunity, second being community reinvestment, third being stability and protections, fourth being equity and wealth building, and five being empowerment. I think you'll recognize some of those words and some of those concepts are already very much latent in the compact, but we have tried to figure out a quantitative way of assessing them, and that's essentially the bulk of the presentation, dealing with displacement risk, dealing with the transit access areas, uh, and dealing with the, the, the housing inclusion questions writ large. Um, there is a lot more detail in it, uh, and I wish I could give it better justice today. Um, so it, what it does essentially is it sets up a framework for evaluation and then evaluates the 10 CASA items. Now, in, in many cases, we had to make a lot of assumptions because we don't know exactly what's going to come out of the other end of the sausage factory in Sacramento. Um, so making those assumptions, and we've tried to make the assumptions as transparent as possible, uh, we've produced uh, the evaluation that you see before you. I do want to thank Vikrant for a lot of work and a lot of weeks and months uh, working with uh, our, our friends in the advocacy community. And as you heard today, the work's not done uh, because there's still some dissatisfaction about the map. Uh, and we, again, think that's an open door that we can continue to explore. Uh, and uh, I, I think we've got the start, though, of, uh, of what should be a useful tool uh, to evaluate not only what we do in CASA, but what we do in a whole series of other policy areas at MTC and ABAG. Thank you, Steve. So um, I guess what we'd like to do this at this point is have a, a little bit of conversation. Obviously, we don't have enough time for everybody uh, to weigh in here, and we do want to make sure that we get to a vote. Um, but I do think we'd love to get some constructive comments about kind of the overall package, um, taking into account the fact that we have had a lot of uh, discussions um, about it. Um, I don't usually do this when I'm chairing, but I feel the need to maybe model what that might look like. Um, and so uh, for me, um, I th I'm at a two. Uh, and I'm at a two um, because I think that there are some small things that we can do uh, to make a big difference that would really move me to one. Uh, I think that there probably are some small things that we can do on the do no harm to sensitive communities. And I think you referenced uh, maybe tinkering with maps thinking about some of the things that may be drafting issues that we can incorporate. And then the other is we talked about this and everybody's mentioned it. Um, there's a need for all of these to move forward together, um, but I don't think that we've articulated yet a concrete way that they will stay linked. So for if, if those things happen, I will definitely be at a one, but I think that is the way that I'm um, looking at this at this point. Mr. Chair, just a point of process. Sure. Would it be possible for each of us to have one minute or 90 seconds to do what you just did to make sure that everybody gets to speak? One, two. If you guys can hold to one minute, <laughs> and, and I, will, I will hold you to it, um, one minute or less. Fred, so why don't we start with you? Fred, there are, tw there are, 25, Fred, there are 25 technical committee members Not required. here. Not required, yeah. 
Thank you. First, I just want to thank everyone who's worked so hard in this compact. Um, as someone who's worked for 27 years trying to create and preserve more affordable housing around the state, um, the status quo is not acceptable to agree with several of the speakers. Secondly, I'm going to be a two. I'm going to vote for this with reservations. The main source of my reservations deal with compact element number seven and around the lack of specificity around and protections around the affordability. My organization, when this gets to Sacramento, if it does, will work against anything that provides public subsidy for something that is not clearly below market housing with rent restrictions and government monitoring of the affordability. So I just want to put down that marker now and I hope people can work on this some more because the 80 to 150 percent with no specified duration is not going to be acceptable in the capital. Uh, thirdly, I agree the maps need to be further revised. There are sensitive communities here that my organization has helped identify that are not currently covered um, with those revisions. I will support at a two level. Thank you. Thank you. 40 seconds. <laughs> Um, everybody doesn't have to weigh in, but yeah, you. All right, I'd like to weigh in. Yes. Um, all right, so thank you all also for um, convening us. I approach a lot of this work with um, a feeling like um, a few cities have borne the um, responsibility of trying to build a lot of housing, and a lot of cities have not, and is trying to equalize the um, playing field in terms of responsibility and ability and carrots and sticks to um, bring more supply online. And I also think, I agree with the comments that um, new construction has the ability to, um, to disrupt communities, but I also think that not building new housing has a dramatic impact on gentrification. And I just think of all of the communities that have not built new housing um, and how, you know, in the San Francisco context, looking at, you know, North Beach or, or Laurel Heights or in the East Bay, Oakland communities of Rock Ridge or until recently Temescal, although Temescal has now some new construction. Um, not building also creates a lot of gentrification. And I think um, I'm, I'm largely supportive of this measure because, yep. You're done. <laughs> uh, so I will, um, there are a few caveats that I think we should explore, including densities as a proxy for um, increased capacity as well as height, but I'll, I'll also um, be a two. Rich, he took 10 seconds from you. <laughs> I'll be even briefer. I, Matt said everything that I wanted to say, so I agree with what he said about number seven, and I'm also a two. Appreciate you. Brief. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. <laughs> Randy. So over the last week, I've been contacted by a number of my fellow former local government compatriots who are expressing a number of concerns about the compact. I think it's essential that somehow we find and are able to articulate a way to make this hold together. Because I think part of the, what I've tried to explain to everyone is that there is a lot at stake for every stakeholder at this, at this table today. Everybody's made compromises. Everybody probably has a concern with some element of the compact. But as a package, this is our best shot to enact a meaningful reform to the way housing is done in the Bay Area. So I think if it, it I think if there's one thing I can stress is the need to make sure this package holds together. Appreciate it. And I'll be supporting it with a two. So shockingly, I'm going to weigh in with a one. I can't tell you how much hope I have based on the progress that everyone at this table has made in respectfully listening to each other, respecting the legitimacy of everybody's concern, and trying to put together a package that will work. I completely agree that this is a package. And it's so far from that first meeting I attended where everyone said, we just did this. It's high rises in PDAs and buses. Why are we still here? That didn't work. There wasn't enough recognition for the needs of sensitive communities. There wasn't enough recognition of the cost structure for housing. There wasn't enough recognition of the physical as well as political barriers. And finally, there wasn't enough even willingness to talk about CEQA. This is a heck of a package. I think it works for workers. 
I think it works for the missing middle, and I think it creates a pathway to home ownership for people who deserve it because they work hard. Thank you. Thank you. Scott. So with, no with nothing but respect for the enormous effort put into this process by the co-moderators and, and fellow technical committee members, I'm here uh, to represent that the Carpenters be believe that the critical that issues that are critical for mission success have not been resolved. For better or for worse, uh, the co-chair has invited to the table a group that values direct communications and an avoidance of uh, papering over dif differences. So in saying that we strongly disagree with the current status of the compacts, particularly, I'm particularly focused on the compact elements that are focusing on entitlement of development but deferring the issue of workforce given how critically linked our production goals for CASA are to workforce development. There's been a 40% decline in real incomes for carpenters in the 40 year, in the last 40 years. The typical construction worker in California on a cost of living basis, basis is 46th in the country across all states. I've been asked to observe a do no harm standard for the CASA compact. And I believe that business as usual approaches to increasing entitlements without addressing, or w without addressing the problems of a voluntary approach to workforce development will perpetuate harm uh, to, to the people who actually build buildings, who construct buildings. So with that, I respectfully look forward to look forward progress on trying to confront those issues. Thank you, Scott. Andreas. Um, I'm at this position at a four, um, and I think that, um, you know, some I think that the fundamentally difficult issues we, and it maybe was too much for this committee to address, we did not, I think, get enough in terms of what I would call the grand bargain. Um, I think it would have been good to be able to send Sacramento kind of a signal from at least a regional perspective where we can all meet on some of the principles and let them work out, um, you know, uh, as Steve said, make the sausage. And I think we failed that. I think we were kicking the can back to Sacramento. Um, and maybe that's where it was, would have to be anyway. Um, but I do think um, we've done great work. And I think the important thing about this process, uh, and I was going to say this in, in the next section, but we may not get there in terms of next steps, is that we continue this work. Um, CASA is it's, it's a process. It's a partnership. Um, I think we have a branding now in the Bay Area where people are talking about CASA. So for us to simply say, great, we've got this report, let's send it, let's vote, and then let's walk away, I think would be a huge mistake uh, because I know myself and my constituencies are fully committed to continuing this work. Um, that's going to, I mean, this, that's going to be with us for the next, you know, 10, 15 years. All right. I don't see placards up. Okay. You don't have to, just a reminder. I appreciate that. Uh -huh. um, I'll be brief. I want to first of all echo the complimentary comments to the group and staff. Unfortunately, I find myself with the organization I represent struggling with elements one and two. And it should be no surprise that apartment owners have a difficult time accepting any form of rent control or eviction control, despite all the other good things in this document. Um, I could just easily vote four or five, but to move things forward, I'm going to vote a three. Right. Thank you. Mark? Oh, yes, it's not perfect, but you know, perfection is not just the enemy of good, it's also the enemy of progress. Um, there's something uh, in this compact for everyone, uh, and I'm going to vote a two. Thank you. Michelle? So I, I think m much has been said and m that I agree with specifically around the feeling that sometimes cities are left with the burden of um, bearing, building all the housing, and, and Oakland has done a tremendous job in doing that. I also want to agree with the comment that Matt indicated in regards to public funds going towards 150% um, of AMI. I think that would um, not go well over with a number of the advocates in the city of Oakland. And so um, because of some of those concerns, I will probably be going with the two. All right. Thanks, Michelle. Tamika, before I go to you, I want to make, it looks like I skipped Denise. 
I just wanted to thank everybody in the room that's worked hard on every aspect, every draft of this. Um, it, it, it's been a remarkable experience. I know based on the audience comments and what we're hearing in the room that, that we still have work to do. And I think that the people who've been involved to date are committed to doing that work. Um, this problem was not created overnight and it won't be solved in one vote in one day. And I think as long as we continue to commit to work these issues through, we can make the region far better for, for, for many, many people. Um, and if we don't vote today in this way, we are giving up the best opportunity I've seen in my professional career to really find a way to get people who are rarely in the same room on the same page. And this moment is too important to let slide. So I ask everyone to keep hanging in there and work through these issues and, um, and vote to support the compact, give it a new life in another place at the steering committee and then on to the legislature. Thanks, Denise. Tamika. Um, I guess I'll just start by, by acknowledging the hard work. I, I mentioned this before. Um, you know, this is not, I appreciate all of the comments that have, were said earlier about the hard work. This work is hard. That's part of why we're here, and that's also part of why we are in the position that we're in. Um, when we sat down to this table, we talked about a, a housing crisis. But what I also heard is we have an affordability crisis. And that actually is a common denominator of all the speakers who have spoken. When you talk about, and, and I, I looked to my colleague, Michelle, when I worked in Oakland, she said to me, affordable housing is not about uh, the traditional definition of affordable housing. Affordable housing is about what people can afford. And what we're talking about is that more and more people cannot afford housing in our city because their incomes aren't good enough. I have people in my program who work every single day and come home and call shelter or their car home. So this is a crisis every single day. And when I leave the CASA table, I go back to my day job where every day I'm putting this, this rock up the hill trying to figure out how we're going to resolve the issues that you all have been talking about for the last 40 years in the Bay Area. So I encourage us to show up in our best way possible, not just today, but for good. Because if we don't, then the Bay Area is not as resilient as the poor people in our city and in our region who is making it happen every day. I encourage us to be at least as resilient as them. Mm -hmm. All right. Ken, you get to follow that. I get to follow that. So <laughs> I'll be a, a two. I think that the majority of this is very, very much worth moving forward and represents real progress. I think the, the thing that for San Francisco that's tricky, no surprise, is how to treat the sensitive community issue. We have, you know, we are generally more advanced along the lines of gentrification and displacement in our community. So the data looks different. And I think there's strong opinions on all sides around how to treat that. And I think since that's a, a, such an uh, integral part of this, we kind of got to keep talking about that to get us to be a one on this. I want to echo what Adi said. I think there are many communities which are experiencing displacement and gentrification, including in San Francisco, that are doing so because of high income people wanting to live in those communities and not because of, of market rate development happening in those communities. So we want to be very careful with putting a pause on development in communities where market rate development might actually ease the problem or at least not make it worse. So that's what we're still thinking about. I also just want to make an observation, which is when I listened to all the public comment, which had a very strong, strong divergence of views, the one thing that everybody agreed on was with tenant protections. And I think that is something for us to continue thinking about. That's the one thing that everyone agrees on. Tamika, we didn't get a number. Uh, two. Ken. Oh, two, I said. All right. Cool. Thank you. Derica. <clears throat> okay. So I'm a four, and let me tell you why. Not because I am – I'm very proud of the work that was done here. Um, I never if, – if I had known what I agreed to when I agreed to co-chair the moderate work, moderate, the production work group or co-moderate, you know, moderate, um, I'm not sure I would have said yes, but I'm really glad I did. Um, but my organization represents uh, service workers, unions, construction workers, people who represent tens of thousands of individuals who have a lot at stake. Um, and they need more time to get there. And so, and I'm going to stick it in with them. I'm going to stick it in with you all, but they need more time. Um, we have got to resolve the labor issues. We've got to get these maps right. Um, and I'm in for that. I'm all in. 
Um, Lynn. First, I just wanted to thank everybody for their hard work. I have to admit, um, maybe professionally, I'm quite the skeptic. I did not think we'd be here today. I thought the process would dissolve at some point. Um, and I can't tell you how amazed I am uh, about the dialogue that's occurred through this process and the fact that we're actually voting on a compact that acknowledges somewhat the concerns of all the folks around the table, although obviously not to the degree, degree some would like. So I'm going to be a two. You know, there's reservations, there's work to be done, um, but I, I think everybody in this group should be proud uh, of the work they put in. Thank you. Jackie. Um, thank you. I also want to thank everyone for their hard work and the co-chairs because I know you spent an enormous amount of time working on this and all the co-chairs of the different subcommittees. I know you guys did a tremendous job. Um, I was moved by Tamika's speech, so it, it moved me up a notch to a two uh, because we have to do something and we just can't leave this with all of this tremendous work. Uh, not moving this agenda forward and so you know from San Jose's perspective we're always going to be concerned about how we look at jobs in the housing balance uh, capping our fees and we feel very strongly about the tenant protections and that they should be strong um, but with that I'm very glad to see the work that we've done and thank you for everything thank you yeah I want a special thanks to Jennifer Derrica Linda and Denise for pushing this thing forward I think this thing would have died a long time ago if not for the excellent work that you all did uh, on behalf of BIA we support in its entirety the compact elements 1 through 10 and I want to make that clear we support 1 through 10 in its entirety our concern comes with the call to action items and specifically one line in the labor provision we support two, three, and four. We support the preamble. We have concerns in how number one is written, and I would echo my colleagues on the building trade side that I think with more time uh, we can get through that, and I think that there are folks that are moving that direction. So I'm supporting moving this forward with a four, and I look forward to being engaged and moving forward with the partners here. And, yeah. Um, really appreciate being with everyone here and I think in particular a group of folks that don't always engage around tenant protections and having the opportunity to uh, to make the case that the sky isn't falling if we have some of these things uh, and I do feel like folks moved on that and really appreciate the ability for for people to uh, engage in principal struggle um, around it and I think uh, I'm going to be a four, and the reason is that I want to continue with that principled struggle. And I don't think that, that we're done for a number, number of the reasons that um, other folks have echoed here. Um, I think uh, a compact to me, if this is a, a group who want to continue working together, um, would include uh, some guidelines around how we're working together and, um, and principles along those lines and uh, pretty well outlined, you know, what will happen to the legislation going to the, to the state level, who would be leading those efforts. Um, can we incorporate more leadership by folks who are most affected? Um, so I would like to see that, and I think in particular in this compact, um, number seven and uh, the the maps um, there is 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 a big problem, and with so much tied to sensitive communities, um, and that particular map, we need to really revisit that. Thanks, Amy. Um, I'm going to use my moderator privilege and break the mold a little bit and be at three point five. Um, <laughs> Uh, first of all, I just want to thank everyone who came today who's been following this work. I've had the chance to speak with probably hundreds of people from all over the region going to different places like Concord and San Jose and East Palo Alto and, you know, in some ways the culmination of about 15 years of advocating for housing and tenant rights has been kind of consolidated into a very dense moment of 18 months um, and I appreciate all of you and all that I've learned from you all um, and I want to say that I uh, had a little moment of tears just now as we I never thought a body of this kind would actually say that tenant rights is the thing that, that many of us agree on and Josh thank you for your three we don't agree on very much it's really three and a half two okay we're in the same place we don't agree on very much we have been at odds for a long time, but um, I want to appreciate your participation and engagement in this. 
um, and I really look forward to the ongoing work we're going to do together because there isn't, we have not resolved a lot of things, but um, we've come a long way. So thank you. Okay. All right, Doug, and then we've got, uh, oh, you're good? Uh, oh, Doug says he's a two, y'all. Amy. Uh, three, three things, uh, just first to say a really heartfelt thank you and our work is very far from done. Uh, Steve, you cannot go anywhere. Uh, we, we need you. We're, we're not done. Um, so, uh, and I know co-chairs how much time and energy and the co-moderators, but we're, we are not done. I think we're all retiring with Steve. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Uh, so my three things, echoing Matt's comments about public subsidies, we need to be targeted to deep affordability. Um, there is more to figure out around the sensitive communities, the process and the maps. And thirdly, emphatically, with lots of drama and urgency, we cannot go forward with this compact unless there's clarity that if there is a major regional transportation measure that goes forward on the ballot, housing needs to be a part of that. We cannot get to 1.5 billion, much less 2.5 billion, if we have clear and strong uh, messages, if we don't have those clear and strong strategies. So that needs to be part of the compact explicitly that we need to consider housing as part of any kind of regional measure that, that goes forward. Uh, so given that um, emphatic emphasis, that, that takes me from a, a 2 to a 2.5, now that Jennifer opened the door to the fractions, uh, because it's really critical that there's a clear message about the priority of housing in the region. And maybe um, I need clarification about whether that's actually in there or not in there, but it's really important to have that message that we need to grow as a region with housing and transportation together. All right. Thank you. Mary. Was that me? Yes, you. So the Pink Alley, we're um, strongly supporting what both Matt Schwartz and Amy just said. In summary, I want to see as deep protections as possible for people who are the most, in, I mean, low-income people are, are, it's not just displacement. People are literally starving. They're even starving in affordable housing, I'm sorry to say, just because costs have gone up and subsidies are so shallow. It's, it's an unbelievable crisis. So every uh, tool that we can bring to this, we need to bring in order to guarantee that any affordable housing that is built stays affordable permanently. Um, anyway, 2.0 for MM. And right. oh, I forgot to say, thank you all so much. What a pleasure working with this group. Thank you, Bill. ever seen one get this far, cover this much ground, and this much geography, and so my hat is off to all of you on that. Um, what I as a developer feel, find most compelling though is, and is at least in part of my business as a property owner, is precisely knowing that a lot of property owners don't support one and two because it became clear throughout this process that if you don't deal with tenant protections at some level, there will be no compact. And I feel very strongly about that. And I think that makes this unusually strong since most of these things are just inclusionary zoning or just um, land use controls or just public sites. Um, I also say as someone involved in Southern California, that if some effort like this bears any fruit, it will have a huge impact statewide. Because there ain't no groups like this in Southern California having these discussions right now. So I think it's really important that we all try to stay together. So I'll go with a 1.5 because no one said that yeah. yet. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Bill. So before I hand it over to Leslie and Michael, Robert, can we get a number? I'm going to go with a 1. All right. Ophelia, number? I'm going with the two. All right. Leslie, Mike? Oh, you want just a number? Or you can say 0 0.1. 0 0.1. No, no I, I'm, I think that the, the vote that is indicative of whether anybody wants to do this is uh, clear, um, whether it's a one, two, three, 
even a four, um, with some degree of, of uh, communication on what we're going to take forward. I think it's clear that some of these things are clear and clear that some are not. Uh, my in, in interpretation of the money is that we specifically on the production side broke it down into affordable and for profit and all the subsidy that you see in those tax measures all goes to affordable, goes to protection, goes to production. None of that billion and a half goes to missing middle, which we've been yelled at by a lot of people who want us to build missing middle. So we came up with the tax uh, uh, rebate, if you will, for 15 years to help subsidize the cities and to pay for the affordability and to pay for the labor requirements, which we thought we had addressed. Um, but there's some stuff we gotta, we gotta sort out. Uh, but I think that for the most part, uh, we've tried to listen and I think we've tried to get what the majority of this group could come together on. And as you heard, there's some people who've never agreed on anything before. So I think, I think the, the vote indi indicates a reasonably strong acceptance of the, where we are. All right, thank you. Leslie. So um, just really, again, just want to thank everybody and especially the moderators for the amazing work that you did. And, and I know that Jennifer is right. They spent an, uh, just a, an incredible amount of time reaching out to people and talking to people and trying to work through concerns. And, you know, I'm really proud of what we have here. When I uh, started this process and when Steve called me and said, would you do this, uh, I said I would do it if what we came to at the end of the day was an actionable plan, not a document, not a report, not 40 items, but something that was doable and that was real and that we would act on. And I think that's what we, we have, I don't think, I know that's what we've ended up with. To Amy's point, uh, it's not done and we know that. We know it's gonna be a heavy lift and we now just move into the next phase and uh, and I appreciate all the comments that we've heard because uh, b because there are some some additional things that we can do to make this even better. Uh, with that, though, I would still I would vote one uh, because I really believe in in what it is that we've we have pulled together and and know that we can make those changes. Thank you. I echo everyone's thanks. Um, we are five minutes over time. What, what do you got, Wally? Um, there are three that have not voted, Scott Littlehill, Tamika Moss five. didn't give a number, and Denise Pinkston. He was five. Five? I'm a one. Okay, Scott. And what was the other, what was the third? Tomika. I was a two. All right. Okay. Um, but since I had a mic, can I say? <laughs> <laughs> Just quickly. Um, there was one comment that I actually heard uh, that I wanted to lift up, which was, um, the suggestion that the co-chairs consider the legislative drafting committee idea. I actually think that that's something that could be really useful in how we get to a, a package that makes it awesome. Cool, you beat me to the punch. I was gonna summarize a couple of things just within 20 seconds and let you go. What I've heard is that there's pr very strong support for this. I've also heard that there are a few things that we can do to make it even stronger. Uh, I would put those into the category of addressing some of the labor concerns, addressing some still outstanding issues on maps, uh, addressing some of the uh, issues that are out there around sensitive communities, and then making sure that we uh, can move forward everything together. So we will continue to work on those things. And I did want to say uh, one of the things that we've heard not only in this meeting, but in prior meetings is the need for or the desire for some type of legislative SWAT team that can travel with this as it goes. And I think that's something that we will definitely be strongly considering. So thanks again, everybody. Thanks again to members of the public who uh, uh, showed up today, those who made public comments and those uh, who didn't. Thank you very much. <laughs>